in a small square cabinet attached to the royal dressing room in the palace of the Tuileries is a little door belonging to a cupboard or closet curiously concealed in the wainscot. This closet is about four feet square and on that partition which faces a door alluded to, there's a row of wooden pegs apparently placed there for the purpose of hanging clothes upon them. But, upon counting the pegs from the right hand, it may be discovered that the fifth will unscrew with little difficulty, and at the bottom of the hole, which the peg thus removed exposes to view, there is a small lock. Into this lock, a key, which remains in the possession of the sovereign, fits, and instead of being turned around, it is pressed inwards. When a door, admirably fitted into the woodwork of the cupboard wall, flies open, the aperture disclosed by the hitherto invisible door reveals a narrow, dark, stone staircase. The steps are precipitous and steep, and they descend into a strange and fearful place, the catacombs of Paris. The catacombs extend beneath almost the whole of that portion of Paris which is situated on the southern side of the river. A small part passes under the bed of the Seine itself. And it is by this tunnel that a private communication is obtained with the Palace of the Tuileries. The catacombs occupy a space, a caverned hollow deep in the earth, much larger than the entire borough of Southwark. And strange is that scene of death. With as much accuracy as could be possibly observed, the bones are heaped up in solid piles to correspond with the disposition of the houses of the city above. That wilderness of human bones tallies with the streets of the living town, whose former inhabitants have found a cemetery there. Thus, anyone who is well acquainted with the southern side of Paris can find his way with ease amidst the mazes of the catacombs. The visitor to that remarkable place of skulls, that vast sepulchre for the relics of millions of individuals, wanders amidst the hideous skeletons and is surrounded by myriads of fleshless bones. The roof is supported by stone pillars of immense solidarity and thickness, and upon the cornices of which skulls are also placed. The greater portion of Paris is built with its own entrails. In other words, the catacombs were formed by the hollowing out of the ground to obtain free stone for the erection of houses and churches. The more the labour is undermined, the greater were the precautions adopted to render this tremendous hollow safe. And thus, the pillars that support the roof are numerous and strong. When the mine was excavated, as far as the surveyors considered it safe to work, the government of the day determined to use this enormous cavern as a catacomb, wherein to deposit those bones that were dug up in the city churchyards when all the cemeteries within the walls were abolished and the suburban sepulchres were formed to receive the dead. But many, many years have elapsed since the catacombs received any additional relics of mortality. Should an earthquake take place in Paris or its vicinity, one half of the entire city would stand chance of being engulfed in the subterranean womb of the catacombs. The listener must not imagine that the regular entrance to the catacombs is the one that we have described and which belongs to the Palace of the Tuileries. This communication is secret and the staircase itself is walled up with skulls so that it's not seen by the visitor. The proper entrance is in the Rue de l'Enfer, but since the revolution of 1830, visitors are only admitted in parties and on stated days. There can be no doubt that the secret staircase leading from the palace was formed by Louis XVI, at a time when popular feeling constantly menaced him with danger, even in the royal dwelling. When the Republic was established, three chests containing gold coins, plates, jewellery and other valuables were discovered concealed amongst a pile of bones 
near the bottom of this stone staircase. This was most probably a provision made by Louis for any casualty that might occur and to which he was constantly liable at the epoch of anarchy and confusion. On one such occasion, when the populace of the Faubourg Saint Antoine invaded the palace and actually carried two small cannon on their shoulders into the royal presence, the queen, Marie Antoinette, was hurrying down the secret staircase when, a regard for the king who was left exposed in the dining room to the fury of the multitude, induced her to turn back. On that occasion, the populace contented themselves with merely intimidating the royal family. During the reign of Napoleon, the secret staircase was forgotten, but there is no doubt that Louis-Philippe keeps a key constantly about his person. Previous to the revolution of 1830, visitors were allowed to inspect the catacombs at their pleasure and to ramble about in the subterranean caverns without a guide. Then, many afflicting accidents occurred. Several individuals lost their way and perished miserably from starvation. Their bodies were afterwards found half-eaten by the vermin that swarm in that mighty Golgotha. In 1824, there was a torchbearer attached to the establishment of the keeper of the catacombs who perpetuated a crime of great atrocity. He was engaged to be married to a young widow in somewhat superior grade of life to his own and who possessed a good income and a quantity of jewellery. Alexandra Franconard, the torchbearer, was a very handsome young man and his personal attractions were no doubt the passport to the widow's heart. For he was known to be of dissipated habits and overbearing disposition. Eugenie Marsac had one child by her deceased husband, a little girl of only three years old when the time of her mourning, two years, had expired. On the very day when she threw off her weeds and donned her gay apparel once more, she called upon Fraconard at the lodge of the keeper of the catacombs. She had her little girl with her, and she had decked herself in the most valuable and attractive articles of jewellery which she possessed. Alexandra proposed to show her the catacombs which she had never yet visited. Madame Marsac ascended, and Alexandra, taking a torch in his hand, conducted her and the child down the stairs into those caverns. In an hour he returned to the lodge, alone. But as the keeper had been relieved in the meantime by one of his subordinates, there was no one to notice the strange occurrence that Alexandra was unaccompanied by anyone. That very day, Alexandra left Paris, and shortly after his departure, great consternation prevailed among Madame Marsac's friends in consequence of the unaccountable disappearance of herself and her child. It could not be for a moment supposed that she had eloped with Alexandra Fraconard because she was her own mistress and might have married whom and when she chose. Inquiries were therefore set on foot and it was ascertained that the widow and her child had called on Alexandra in the catacombs and accompanied him into the caverns and they had not been seen to return. Farther investigation led to the discovery of the unfortunate woman and her child, both cruelly murdered in an obscure nook of the catacombs. The woman's skull was fractured at the back part, and the child's brains were literally dashed out against a pillar. A heavy piece of wood, covered with blood, was found near the spot, and with that weapon, the unfortunate female had evidently been murdered. Horrible to relate, that there was proof that the monster must have taken the innocent child by the feet and dashed its head against the stone pillar. The body of the female had been plundered of all the ornaments of jewellery which the deceased was proved to have had about her on the day when she thus met her death. Information was immediately given to the police, but six months passed away without affording any trace of the assassin. At length, he was captured in a singular manner. 
A gendarme one evening entered a small tavern in the village of La Racousse between Calais and Saint-Ornier and 190 miles from Paris. A person dressed like a labourer was sitting by the kitchen fire. The gendarme was about to light his pipe and looked around for a match. The stranger exclaimed, Here, I will give you a light. And taking a letter from his pocket, he tore off a piece, folded it, lighted it, and handed it to the officer. The gendarme thanked him and took the paper and applied it to his pipe. In so doing, the eyes of a gendarme fell upon some writing on the unburnt part of the paper. He immediately extinguished the light, and holding the paper in his hand, with apparent carelessness of manner, he said to the stranger, Oh, did you know of Madame Marsac, who was murdered six or seven months ago in the catacombs at Paris? The countenance of the stranger assumed a ghastly appearance, and the gendarme exclaimed, Alexander Fraconard, you are my prisoner. The murderer was conveyed to Paris, tried and condemned to death. The letter, which had thus singularly led to his detection, was one which the widow had written to him a few days before her violent death. Her name appended to the letter and caught the gendarme's eye when he was lighting his pipe. But how could Alexandra have been so silly as not to destroy the letter? We cannot answer that question. We cannot fathom that inscrutable dispensation of providence which so frequently leads murderers to betray themselves by their own want of precaution. Alexandra Fraconard was guillotined on the 7th of March, 1825, upon the Place de Grieve at Paris. We could relate numerous other incidents connected with the catacombs, but we must postpone further attention to the subject to a future article.